So we will be waiting for 5 minutes for everyone else to try and join then we will start the session. I hope I am visible. I am going to present my screen right here. PowerPoint is visible, right? Yeah, the PowerPoint is visible. Okay. So, <coughs> I welcome you all to the week 7 PMRF and PTL session on the NPTEL course Bioengineering and Interface with Biology and Medicine. The PMRF and PTL uh, sessions are held by uh, a PMRF fellow such as myself and the students who have enrolled for the NPTEL course. In these sessions, we go through the various assignment problems of previous year's uh, NPTEL course so that the students get a better understanding of this week's course content as well as how to approach the various assignment questions that are given in the course. So <clears throat> this is uh, the week 7 uh, session. In uh, the week 7 course content, we covered mostly amino acids, proteins, proteomics and various techniques that are used in proteomics as well, uh, we had, uh, as, well as having a lecture on bioinformatics. So okay, let us get into it. But first, uh, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Anubhav Chatterjee. I'm a PMR fellow and PhD scholar at the Developmental Neurobiology Lab, Department of Biological Sciences and Bioengineering, Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. So, uh, as I said, our this session will be majorly on different types of proteomics techniques in order to analyze protein sequences as well as understand different classification and structures of amino acids as well as going through a session on bioinformatics. So let us get started. So this is the first question for today. 
uh, the question reads except for one all amino acids have the same general structure as seen in the graphic below so this graphic is the general amino acid structure if you have uh, looked at amino acid structure before this is the general structure of an amino acid but uh, determine which amino acid is this so we are asked to determine which is the one amino acid which does not follow this particular structure the exception is what we are being asked to uh, like answer like what is the uh, amino acid that does not have the amino acid structure which looks like this what structural benefit does it provide to the structure of a protein uh, select the correct combination from the following options so all amino acids have a general structure which looks like this but only one uh, amino acid that, that does not look anything like this you are being asked which is the amino acid and what is the structural benefit of the amino acid in a protein so uh, the options given here are proline uh, it has a imidazole ring and absorbs the uv light and because of that the proteins can be quantified easily from any solution histidine which also has a imidazole ring and imparts neutral charge in a protein at ph of 7 glycine it hinders the formation of hydrogen bonds in the helix creating break in the structure and are called helix breakers and methionine it, uh, it has a most non-polar aliphatic R group and causes disulfide bond in proteins. So only one option out of the four is correct because this is like single option correct answer. So I would encourage everyone to try and uh, answer whichever you uh, like. Try and put in the chat box whichever answer you think is the correct one. Only one of them is correct. So ABCD uh, you can just type into the chat box. I guess you can at least go ahead and guess which is the correct answer. We will go through the solution slide and understand which should be the correct one. So Anshuman says it is C glycine. That uh, glycine is the exception to the general structure of amino acids, and that it hinders the formation of hydrogen bonds in helix, creating break in the structure and is known as helix breaker. Okay, so at least we have one answer. We can go ahead and look into uh, look into the structure of amino acids first uh, so in order to answer this particular question let us first look into the structure of amino acids so this is the general structure of what an amino acid looks like it has a c mid, uh, a, it consists of an amino group right here and a carboxylic acid group on the other hand and that is why it is known as an amino acid amino from the amino group and acid from the carboxylic acid group Further, these two are connected to a central carbon atom which is known as the alpha carbon. And the alpha carbon also is linked to an hydrogen atom which is always there and a diff uh, uh, R group which is a hydrocarbon side chain. And this R group is what differs between all the amino acids. So different, uh, uh, different amino acids will have different R groups. So that is what uh, the, uh, is the difference between all amino acids. It is just this R group. Everything else is more or less the same. So uh, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins joined by peptide linkages. So peptide linkages are by the linkage by via which 
different amino acids are linked together to form long chains of peptides. Each contains an amino group and a carboxylic group as well as a R hydrocarbon chain. Amino acids differ depending on the different composition of the R hydrocarbon chain. Exception to this particular uh, structural rule is glycine which has a hydrogen atom as a R group. So a glycine does not have a, a hydrocarbon R but it uh, only has a hydrogen atom in its place. And this uh, in turn hinders formation of hydrogen bonding. Because for uh, hydrogen bonding to take place you should have either a highly uh, electronegative group or the presence of a hydrogen atom. So uh, a highly electronegative group bound to a hydrogen atom since we do not have anything like that here glycine uh, hinders the formation of hydrogen bonds and that is why it is no, also known as helix breaker because it does not form the hydrogen bonding necessary to have a stable helix structure. Only 20 amino acids are commonly uh, encoded by the genetic code and these are known as proteo amino, uh, amino acids and now uh, we will just look into what these 20 amino acids are in so these are our uh, 20 amino acids which are encoded by our genetic code. These are very well classified into separate uh, groups. So uh, they, the first group contains amino acids that are electrically uh, that have electrically charged side chains. That is, they have a charge on the side chain. These include the positive. This can be subdivided into the positively charged amino acids and the negatively charged amino acids. The positively charged amino acid contain the arginine, histidine and lysine which have a positive uh, side chain as you can see right here or uh, aspartic acid and glutamic acid which have a negatively charged side chain. Next uh, division is uh, where we have polar uncharged side chains that is we have partial distribution of charge but not a positive or negative coming up. So these include serine, threonine, asparagine and glutamine which have these polar OH groups or you know amino, uh, amide groups present on their ends which are actually uh, which give them the polar characteristic but these are uncharged and finally we have amino acids which are hydrophobic in nature which uh, whose side chain is completely non-polar and uh, these are uh, uh, water fearing amino acids which do not like water at all this, in, uh, uh, this group contains alanine, valine Isoleucine, leucine, methionine, phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. So, in this particular uh, group, there is another sub uh, subdivision. So, we can divide them into uh, alkyl uh, side chains, which have only uh, a chain of hydrocarbons that are uh, attached as a R group, or aromatic side chains, as we can see here in the case of phenylalanine tyrosine and tryptophan which have aromatic side chains and uh, these three are very special to us because uh, aromatic side chain containing amino acids can undergo uh, when you throw light at them they can absorb the light and then emit the light at a different wavelength and this is very useful for uh, quantification of uh, proteins present in a sample uh, as using a technique known as UV visible spectrophotometry you can uh, throw light into a sample and depending on how well the protein absorbs the uh, light that is being thrown at it, uh, we can determine the concentration of the protein present in the sample. And this is done by the, for, uh, by the absorb, uh, absorbance property of these three aromatic side chain containing amino acids. Out of all of these, there is also a special case of amino acids that are present which are neither which do not fall into these three categories that is do, they do not have an electrically charged side chain they are not polar and they do not uh, have a hydrophobic side chain either these include cysteine which, uh, which has a SH group as at its end glycine which does not have anything as its R group so uh, uh, nothing here means that there is a hydrogen atom here and finally proline which forms a rounded structure which with its own amino acids uh, with its own NH group and thus uh, it also uh, consists of a special case. Next uh, we also have uh, so since the names are uh, too large around here 
we uh, abbreviate them into either three letter subdivisions or one letter subdivisions in order to better uh, write the entire structure of a peptide in the small one letter abbreviations so three letter abbreviations are very easy to see it is just the first three letters but the one letter ones are separate because many of the amino acids start with the same name so alanine although uh, alanine and arginine both start with a alanine has a a to start as a one letter abbreviation whereas arginine has r as its one letter abbreviation so this is the essentially the codon uh, the amino acid table uh, i would recommend you know getting to know the three letter abbreviation and some of the one letter abbreviation as and when required so the, that was the classification of amino acids uh, does anyone want to uh, ask anything about this So next we have a video which uh, it tells us about more about classification of amino acids. You just have to tell me if the audio is there or not. All right, so, so let's go through the classification of amino acids. And I've highlighted the word class. The audio is there, right? within classification for you because I'm going to paint for you a picture of a classroom that is full of 20 different amino acids. And just picture this is the most diverse classroom you've ever seen because each amino acid has their own unique side chain and this makes them distinctly different from the amino acid next to them. And just like a real classroom full of kids, even though each amino acid is unique and special in their own way, you can start to see that some of these amino acids are more alike than they are different. And we can start to see these similarities in the chemical properties of the side chains. And, and this allows us to group them together into various categories. And those chemical properties include the charge of the side chain, the ability of the side chain to undergo hydrogen bonding, and also whether or not we can classify that side chain as being either acidic or basic. So the 20 amino acids can be split broadly into kind of two main groups. The first group includes the nonpolar amino acids, and then the second group includes the polar ones. And the nonpolar amino acids can also be thought of as the hydrophobic or water-fearing amino acids. And conversely, you have the polar ones. Those can be considered hydrophilic, meaning water-loving. And yet another way that I like to kind of think about these two main groups are the hydrophobic amino acids. They're kind of like the water haters. They don't really want to interact with water at all. They rather just interact with themselves. Whereas the hydrophilic amino acids are very open and welcoming to interacting with water. And so they're water lovers. And then within the two groups of nonpolar hydrophobic and polar hydrophilic amino acids, you then have a further breakdown into subgroups. And those subgroups include those amino acids that have alkyl side chains, aromatic side chains, neutral ones, acidic ones, or basic ones. So let's take a closer look at those amino acids that have alkyl groups as side chains. And as you can see here, we have seven different amino acids, and I've just drawn out the side chain for you. I've left the rest of the molecule out just to fit everything in here. And we have glycine, alanine, valine, methionine, leucine, isoleucine, and proline. And proline is the exception. I've drawn out the entire amino acid there because as you can see, its side chain forms this interesting ring structure with the amino group in the backbone of the molecule. So I just included it there for our completeness. So all of these side chains are made up of alkyl groups, with the one exception being glycine, because its side chain has only a hydrogen atom in it. But because it behaves similarly to an alkyl chain side group, it gets slumped into this category of amino acids. And whenever you see an amino acid with an alkyl group as its side group, you should be thinking that this amino acid is nonpolar. 
and so they're also going to be hydrophobic. Now let's take a closer look at those amino acids that have aromatic groups as part of their side chain. And remember, we're still under the umbrella of nonpolar hydrophobic amino acids here. And so I've drawn out for you here two amino acids, phenylalanine and tryptophan. And what should you be thinking when you're looking at these amino acids? So besides thinking, oh, those amino acids must smell really good because they're called aromatic amino acids. Well, that might be true, but you should also be thinking the same thing that you think when you see amino acids with alkyl groups as their side chains. These amino acids that you see here are also nonpolar and hydrophobic. And that kind of makes sense because aromatic chains are also just made up of carbons and hydrogens. And you weren't wrong if you thought that aromatic compounds might smell really good because many of our most aromatic herbs and spices that we're all familiar with, like basil or cinnamon and vanilla, are composed of the same sorts of ring structures that we see here. All right, so now that we've tackled the nonpolar hydrophobic amino acids, let's dive on into the polar and hydrophilic amino acids. The first group that we will look at is the neutral group. Here we have serine, threonine, asparagine, glutamine, cysteine, and tyrosine. The way that I remember that these are the polar amino acids is that these amino acids have a side chain that contain an oxygen or a sulfur atom, which tends to hog all the electrons around them to create a localized negative charge over that atom and then a positive charge over the rest of the side chain. So you can kind of see why these amino acids like to hang out with water now, since water is also polar in the same way. And these amino acids are considered neutral because although they are polar enough to interact with water, they're not strongly polar enough to qualify as an acid or a base. So which of the polar hydrophilic amino acids do qualify as acidic? Well, that would be these two amino acids here aspartic acid and glutamic acid. As you can see, these amino acids have a carboxylic acid as part of their side chain, which is a very willing, strong hydrogen donor, which qualifies these amino acids as acidic. When these side chains do donate their hydrogen and they're left in anion form, then in that case, we refer to them as aspartate and glutamate, respectively. So you might see them referred to in that way. Last but not least, we have the basic amino acids, and they are histidine, lysine, and arginine. And the way I remember that these amino acids are basic is that if you take a closer look at their side chains, you see a few nitrogen atoms. And remember that nitrogen is a very willing proton acceptor. And this is why they qualify as basic. amino acids so that was the video on classification of amino acids uh, does anyone have any questions regarding this video and like uh, this is essentially the classification we just saw in the previous slide so the subdivision into various subdivision of amino acids into various classes which include uh, electrically charged polar, hydrophobic and uh, some special cases. This can be incorporated into various other categories as well but can also be say, uh, in their own different category. Does anyone want to ask anything regarding this classification of amino acids? So, So getting back to our question, so uh, except for one, all amino acids have the same general structure as seen in the graphic below. Determine which amino acid is this and what structural benefit does it provide to the structure of a protein. Select the correct combination from the following options. So the correct answer is glycine. So glycine uh, in the general structure, glycine instead of having a R hydrocarbon chain glycine only has a hydrogen atom so that is the one that is the most different and it hinders the formation of hydrogen bonds in the helix creating a break in the structure and is known as helix breaker so that was the answer to the first question does anyone have any doubt regarding this
Okay. So we move on to our second question, which is: Let's assume you are working with a antimicrobial peptide and then used UV visible spectrophotometer to measure the concentration of peptides present in your sample at a monochromatic wavelength which peptide will be the most easily detected so you are working with various peptides present in a sample and you want to use uv visible spectrometer uh, or uv visible spectrophotometry in order to determine the concentration of the peptide present in your sample which peptide among the following four do you think will be the best detected using uv vis spectrophotometry the options are given here these are the one liter codes of various amino acids so uh, only one of them is correct uh, you can go ahead and type what you think is the correct answer in the chat box So the question is which uh, amino acid will which uh, peptide will show the most absorbance using UV visible spectrophotometry uh, so as we had just discussed that uh, the amino acid that should do uh, should absorb the most uh, UV light or should absorb light at all are the ones that have a aromatic side chain so we just have to look into the peptide sequence and determine which peptide has an aromatic side chain among all of them. Okay, so uh, first then let me help you out on here. So as uh, we have just discussed, uh, what are aromatic uh, amino acids? Aromatic amino acids are a classification of amino acids which contain an aromatic R side chain. These include phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. As you can see, okay, so uh, Archana uh, tells us that, uh, uh, okay, so Archana says that uh, option one should be the correct one. So let us, uh, I will get back to that in a moment. So. Aromatic uh, amino acids are ones which have aromatic uh, side chain as you can see right here Phenylalanine, tyrosine and tryptophan all three of them have an aromatic side chain So uh, due to the presence of the aromatic side chain these amino acids can go ahead and absorb incident monochromatic light And emit light at a different wavelength So the, these amino acids uh, can absorb light uh, the UV spectra of light and emit at in the visible spectra and that is why using uh, the, uh, this particular phenomenon, uh, it is very easy to measure the concentration of peptides present in a sample using a UV visible spectrophotometer. So what you do is that you prepare your uh, sample, put it into a cuvette which is a very sm uh, uh, cylindrical small glass container and put it into the spectrophotometer machine, turn it on and the spectrophotometer just, pull, uh, just throws light at it at your sample and de depending how much of it is absorbed and how much is transmitted the uh, machine can calculate uh, the concentration of the peptide that is present inside the solution so this is what the theory behind aromatic uh, amino acids and how they are used in order to determine the concentration of your sample so <clears throat> as you can see right here that uh, here in this particular picture uh, there is already the single letter amino acid code given for all of them. So, phenylalanine starts with an F, tyrosine with a Y, and tryptophan with a W. So, now I would uh, ask any, every one of you to try and answer this particular question: which peptide contains the most of these and uh, should be the correct, should be the one that uh, shows UV visible spectrophotometry?
so Archana has already said that it is number one so I would encourage everyone else to try so Anshuman also says it is A okay and Okay, so uh, as we can see that uh, upon comparing the single letter codes here, we can see the option number one contains tyrosine abs, uh, as well as tryptophan, but uh, all of the other three options do not contain either of these. So the correct option is number one that uh, Archana and Anshul both pointed out. So number one is the correct answer. So anyone who wants to ask anything regarding this question? Is it fine? I guess it's fine. Okay, so moving on to the next question. A, a peptide bond with varied uh, torsion angles uh, designated A, B, and C is seen in the diagrams uh, below. Identify them correctly. So we have a peptide bond shown right here between the C uh, carboxylic acid group and the amino acid group and essentially this is the peptide backbone of a protein. So we are now asked looking at this particular diagram uh, which are the various torsion angles so A, B and C represent uh, angles which are named uh, psi, phi and omega. So we have to determine which angle is known as phi which is psi and which is omega. So the options given in this particular question are, uh, so the options are given right here. So this is essentially a jumble between omega, phi and psi and a, b and c. So you can go ahead and uh, answer which you think is the correct option here. So uh, in the tor the torsion angles are each have an individual name. The, so the angle between C, the alpha carbon and the, the carboxylic acid carbon is known something. The carboxylic acid as well as the amino acid uh, nitrogen is uh, known as something. So uh, these are denoted as ABC in this particular question. And we have just to match the original names with ABC as given right here. So you can, uh, you know. Go ahead. If you know, you can uh, mm -hmm. stay, uh, type in the uh, chat box or you can just guess and answer this. So let us, okay, so uh, Archana says uh, that the correct option is D, that is A is the psi angle, B is the omega angle and C is the phi angle, okay. So let us go through the solution slides and get back to that. Uh, so 
peptide linkages uh, let us first uh, uh, get to know about peptide linkages so this is the structure uh, general structure of uh, amino acid that we just saw so amino amino group carboxylic acid group connected to a alpha carbon in the middle to which another side chain is linked so if we remove the side chain if we did not have the side chain we will only have the so if uh, for convenience we are not writing the r so we will only have the amino acid uh, the amino group and the carboxylic group and the hydrogen so and uh, if we do that so uh, let us first look into what is a peptide linkage so different amino acids are uh, linked together using peptide linkages in order to form the protein backbone what happens is that uh, the carboxylic acid OH reacts with the amino uh, amine groups hydrogen and these two react in order to push the water out from the entire thing so that uh, so essentially this part goes out and the carbon and the nitrogen link together to form the peptide bond so in the, uh, the OH and the hydrogen go, go away and we have a link between the carbon and the nitrogen to form the peptide bond and this is what a dipeptide looks like so from one end you will have uh, amine group followed by the alpha carbon followed by the carboxylic acid followed by the followed by another amine group another alpha carbon and another carboxylic acid group so this is how the entire dipeptide looks like so this is what uh, happens in a peptide linkage so now next uh, so as i was saying if for uh, convenience we remove the R1 and R2 H groups, we will only have a very linear chain of uh, a nitrogen, alpha carbon, carboxylic carbon, then another uh, nitrogen, then another alpha carbon and another carboxylic carbon. Now, let us look into what torsion angles are. In order to determine, so uh, as you can see, uh, torsion angles or peptide torsion angles are defined as three consecutive angles between four different atoms in a peptide linkage. So if we go back here, we had uh, alpha carbon followed by carboxylic carbon followed by a nitrogen followed by another uh, alpha carbon. You can see that the same trend is being followed here. Uh, we have just removed the hydrogen and the uh, hydrocarbon R group. We have the nitrogen, we have the alpha carbon, we have the carboxylic carbon and we have the second amine. And you, uh, in this particular structure, there are different angles that have been previously specified. So uh, these angles are the phi, psi and the omega angles between these four atoms. And this determine if a particular peptide backbone structure is stable or not. So what happens is that these three uh, angles have very restricted uh, values that they can attain and using these restricted values one can uh, say if the particular peptide is uh, thermodynamically stable or not so uh, and this is uh, determined using something uh, probably you have heard of which is known as the ramachandran plot so if we plot the values of these angles we will get various uh, predictions based on which we can determine if our peptide is stable or not but essentially the entire discussion boils down to that in the peptide bond we can deter uh, we can calculate angles between the f these four different atoms and depending on these angles we can determine if the peptide is stable or not so but how are the uh, angles determined so the angle between the first amino uh, amines nitrogen and the alpha carbon is known as phi between the alpha carbon and the carboxylic carbon is known as uh, psi and between the carboxylic acid carbon and the nitrogen is known as omega so this is given here as well so uh, alpha carbon and nitrogen is known as phi alpha carbon and carbon is no, uh, the carboxylic acid carbon is known as psi and carbon uh, carboxylic acid carbon and nitrogen is known as omega one thing to note is that the omega angle is very restricted because this particular uh, angle, uh, this particular bond between the carbon and the nitrogen has a par partial double bonded nature. So this bond cannot rotate much at all. 
and that is why it is known uh, omega angle is very restricted compared to that the phi and the psi angles are just single bonds and they can rotate a lot among their axis and they can have various uh, values so uh, these are the three angles the phi psi and omega angle and you can plot them into what is known as a ramachandran plot to determine if our particular structure is very stable or not so that was torsion angle so anyone wants to uh, add anything to this want to ask anything from this So, yeah, so uh, from this particular question, we can uh, come back and uh, say from uh, uh, looking at the, so we know that the uh, angle between the alpha carbon and the nitrogen is phi, the alpha carbon and the uh, hydroxylic carbon, uh, uh, the carboxylic acid carbon is uh, psi and the carboxylic acid carbon and nitrogen is omega. So coming back to our question, we can see then the angle uh, angle C between the carboxylic acid and the uh, amino acid is C which should be omega and that is the only one option that is given here so that is B so uh, the carboxylic acid and the alpha carbon that is uh, as we have seen psi so uh, B is given as psi and here we are not given the nitrogen but between the carbon and the nitrogen it is always fine that is the angle so the correct option is B Okay, so let us move on ahead and look at the next question. So the question reads, you used a size exclu uh, exclusion chromatography to purify a protein with a molecular weight of 352 kilodaltons. Next you have uh, run the proteins on a page which is a polyacrylamide uh, gel electrophoresis in presence of SDS and beta mercaptoethanol or 2-BME which produce two distinct bands as shown in the following image with the molecular weights 132 kilodalton and 44 kilodalton respectively. The given gel picture is uh, presented below which is the most likely explanation for the protein. So what you have done is that you have run a native page here or just size exclusion chromatography here followed by a SDS page of the same protein. In the first uh, in the first run you see one band corresponding to 352 kilodalton uh, and in the second uh, you observe uh, two bands with uh, two bands with respect to 132 kilodalton and a 44 kilodalton band. So we are asked what is the most likely explanation for the entire uh, thing. The options that are given here are the protein has three subunits having 352 kilodalton, 132 kilodalton and 44 kilodalton molecular weights. The protein is a homodimer of two heterodimers 132 kilodalton and 44 kilodalton. The protein is a heterodimer of two homodimers 132 kilodalton and 44 kilodalton and the final option is both b and c options are correct so uh, you can go ahead and uh, try to answer which you think is the correct one
ओके सो वी हैव टू आंसर्स आई गेस सो अर्चना सेज इट इज सी द प्रोटीन इज अट्रोडाइमर ऑफ टू होमोडाइमर वन है थर्टी टू किलो डायल्टन एंड फोर्टी फोर किलो डायल्टन एंड अमरदीप सेज इट इज बी द प्रोटीन इज अमोडाइमर ऑफ टू हेट्रोडाइमर वन हंड्रेड थर्टी टू किलो डायल्टन एंड फोर्टी फोर किलो डायल्टन सो इट इज गो हेड एंड लुक इन टू वट एक्जैक्टली इज द डिफरेंस बिटवीन एच डी एस एंड अ नेटिव पेज इन ऑर्डर टू एंसर दिस पर्टिकुलर क्वेश्चन सो एच डी एस पेज वॉज इज नेटिव पेज सो एच डी एस पेज इज अ सेपरेशन टेक्निक दैट सेपरेट्स प्रोटीन ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ मास एंड नेटिव पेज इज द इलेक्ट्रोफोलिटिक टेक्निक दैट सेपरेट्स प्रोटीन ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ देयर ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ देयर साइज एंड चार्ज सो native page uh, is that uh, older technique that was previously used in which you had more than one variable on which the proteins were separated so that included the size as well as the charge and uh, whereas hds page only separates protein on the basis of their mass so uh, since uh, so the criteria of the diff, uh, on uh, the criteria of separation is also different between the two page techniques second is the nature of the gel uh, the in sds page the gel is denatured whereas in native page the gel is not denatured the uh, what uh, we mean by denatured is that that the proteins are denatured using sds before running on the gel so that means that every one of uh, their uh, van der waals interactions the hydrogen bonding the disulfide bond interactions everything is broken up first and then the gel uh, is run whereas native page uh, the gel uh, is not denatured and the protein is uh, run in its native or in vivo form and finally uh, in case of uh, denaturation sds is added to the gel to impart a negative charge on the protein samples so in order to uh, get the charge criteria out of uh, the picture and only separate the proteins on the basis of molecular uh, weight uh, we put sds into the mixture what sds does is it coats the entire protein is negative in negative charge and uh, in, since the entire protein is covered in negative charge uh, essentially all the proteins have the same charge while running in the gel and thus we do not have to worry about the charge factor playing a role in separation further uh, sds also denatures the proteins so proteins run uh, in the form of individual subunits so we i if uh, say hemoglobin uh, has four subunits two alpha two beta so when we run uh, hemoglobin on sds page we should see two separate bands one for the alpha one for the beta whereas uh, in case of native page uh, no such denaturation occurs and proteins run in the quaternary structure so in case of hemoglobin we will see a band which is essentially the addition of both the sds page bands much higher in the gel and only a single band will be present which will uh, represent the quaternary structure of hemoglobin so in case of sds page two separate bands two alphas two betas and in case of uh, in native page only one larger band way up above which will essentially be the addition of the two alphas and the two betas of the sds page basis of separation the basis of separation uh, for the proteins uh, the proteins are separated on the basis of mass uh, in case of sds page and the proteins are separated based on size and charge so two factors and finally protein stability and recovery the proteins are not stable in sds page and hence cannot be recovered because the denaturation process is irreversible once you put sds page uh, sds into your solution uh, you disrupt all the bonds that were uh, present there so uh, you won't get your protein back in any form but in case of protein uh, in case of native page the proteins can be recovered and eluded out of the gel and be reused for further downstream analysis so this is essential difference between sds page and native page uh, does anyone want to add anything to this okay so moving on ahead 
we go back to our question. So what we saw in our native page was a 352 kilo Dalton band. And in our SDS uh, page gel, we had a 132 kilo Dalton band and a 44 kilo Dalton band. So essentially uh, what should happen as we have discussed that the SDS page band should add up to our native page band. But uh, if you add both of this up, you get a value around what, 176 kilo Dalton, which is essentially half of this one so what it means is that there must be multiple of the subunits that are uh, that have the same weight and are showing up as a single band so this 132 kilo dalton essentially can be two 132 kilo dalton bands that are overlapping and this 44 kilo dalton band can be two uh, 44 kilo dalton subunits that are overlapping so how do we exactly determine which is the case? So we essentially keep, uh, so this is just basic mathematics. We just keep on adding till we end up at 352 kilo data. So uh, just a bit of quick math. Just for the sake of Okay. So as you can see we have a 352 that we have to uh, get to. So what I was saying is that uh, our both of these combined can only give us 176 which is essentially the, uh, the half of 352. So uh, what exactly we, uh, so since the exact, uh, it is exactly the half of uh, 100, 352, what is happening here is there are two 132 bands, so 132 plus 132 plus 244 bands, which gives us the entire 352. So two subunits are uh, of the molecular weight 132 and two subunits are of the molecular weight 44 all four of them added to 352 so now the options that were given are uh, the options that were given are as follows uh, so the first option is obviously incorrect there are not three subunits but uh, uh, four subunits uh, so we go to the second one the protein is a homodimer of two heterodimers 132 kilo dalton and 44 kilo dalton so what uh, this means is that there uh, is a het there is a heterodimer which first interacts among itself so 132 subunit which interacts with the 44 subunit which is one entire subunit and two of these form the uh, form our uh, mature protein so a 132 plus a 44 is one subunit it interacts with another of the similar subunit which is also 132 and 44 and four of them together form our 352 uh, kilo dalton entire protein this can be one possibility the other possibility can be the other possibility can be that uh, we have one uh, we have one hit the homodimer formed from two 132 uh, kilo dalton subunit so one th 132 kilo dalton another 132 kilo dalton this form of homodimer and another 44 uh, kilo dalton and another 44 kilo dalton these two form a homodimer and these two subunits interact amongst themselves to form a heterodimer so essentially you are still getting four subunits but the order of interaction are the two 132 and 44 interacting before uh, joining among themselves so we have uh, two heterodimers which form a homodimer or we have the 132 interacting with another 132 and a 44 interacting with another 44 to form two sets of homodimers which then form a heterodimer is the entirely like out there so uh, it can be either of these so the answer is either b or c
is that okay no i do not uh, archana okay so uh, the answer to this particular question it can either be the protein is a homodimer of two heterodimers 132 and 44 or the protein is a heterodimer of two homodimers 132 and 40. Either of them are correct and thus the option that is correct is uh, D, both B and C are possible. Okay, so uh, I guess there is no more question from this. Does anyone want to ask anything from this? we go to the next question you have recently joined a lab which specializes in proteomics in infectious diseases your supervisor has requested you to construct a pipeline for your forthcoming investigations which incorporate both gel and mass spec based proteomics what variables do you believe are necessary for designing a good proteomics experiment so we have been given various options. The first is an appropriate choice of disease and control groups, best quality RNA primers, high quality trypsin enzyme, purified TAC and PFU enzymes, sterilized room with a HEPA filter, purified antibodies and a blotting kit. I am audible again, right? Hello? Okay. Uh, so, uh, let us go back to the question. So, you have uh, recently joined a lab which specializes in proteomics in infectious diseases. Your supervisor has requested you to construct a pipeline for your forthcoming investigations which incorporate both the gel and mass spec based proteomics. What variables do you believe are necessary for designing a good proteomics experiment? So we have been given uh, various options. The options include uh, appropriate choice of disease and control groups. Best quality RNA primers, high quality trypsin enzyme, purified TAC and PU, PFU uh, enzymes, sterilized room including HEPA filter, purified antibodies and blotting kit, and high resolution microscope combined with imaging software. So, which of the following do you think uh, is uh, necessary? For uh, you know, developing a pipeline in proteomics, the options are given here. We have given various choices here. Okay, so Amartip says uh, it is number one: uh, appropriate choice of disease and control groups, best quality primers, high quality trypsin, uh, sterilized uh, room with HEP filter, and purified antibodies and blotting kit. Okay, so uh, Archana also says A. Okay, so and any more answers? Anyone else wants to try and uh, and, and answer this? Okay, Shreya also says it is A. Okay, so. Yeah, for proteomics workflow, uh, all of you were almost correct that uh, we need appropriate choice of disease and control groups, high quality trypsin, sterilized group with a HEPA filter, purified antibodies and a blotting kit, but we do not need RNA primers, right? So, uh, because there is no need for RNA primers in a proteomics workflow, we are only dealing with proteins. So, uh, for gel based or mass spec based uh, proteomics, we only need some uh, things that are 
essentially relevant to a mass spec based proteomics approach so uh, rna primers are not something that we are looking for uh, in case of proteomics uh, directly so the option uh, that is correct is c that is appropriate choice of disease and control groups high quality trypsin enzyme sterilized room with uh, including hepa filter and purified antibodies and a blotting kit is that okay So uh, we go to the next question which is in a mass spectrometer the ionization source performs which of the following functions. Please select the appropriate ionization technique involved with the mentioned activity and pick the correct answer from the following options. The options are number one converts the analyte into gas phase ions in vacuum. This method is called soft ionization. Number two is converts the analyte into liquid phase ions in vacuum. This is called hard ionization. In MALDI, the analyte is mixed with the aromatic matrix and bombarded with laser. This is a called a soft ionization. And MALDI, the analyte is mixed with the aliphatic matrix and bombarded with matrix uh, is bombarded with fast beam of argon or xenon atoms this is called hard ionization uh, so depending on the statement given here you have to choose which of them are correct so the different options are 1 and 2 1 and 3 2 and 3 and 2 and 4 so whichever you think is correct you can just put it into the chat box So Amartip says it is B, uh, that is uh, converts sunlight into gas phase ions, uh, which is known as soft ionization. And uh, in MALDI, the analyte is mixed with aromatic matrix and bombarded with laser, which is also known as soft ionization. Shubhada says uh, it is C, uh, with, that is uh, converts analyte into liquid phase ions in vacuum, which is known as higher ionization, and MALDI. Is the analyte is mixed with uh, aromatic matrix and bombarded with lasers this is called soft ionization okay so anyone else wants to try and uh, answer this question So uh, let us first look into what ionization exactly is with respect to mass spectrometry. So ionization is the technique by which sample analyte is converted to gaseous phase ions. So the entire workflow of mass spec is first to convert your particular uh, sample into gaseous phase ions and then you throw them down a, a large long tube and depending uh, how long they it takes them to flow through the tube depending on the charge magnetic field or the distance between the two ends of the tube you determine what the mass by charge ratio of the particular uh, sample is so but the starting phase of all the techniques is the same you have to, first you have to ionize your sample which is essentially you have to take your liquid sample make it into a gaseous sample which has different charges so ionization is the technique by which the sample analyte is converted to a gaseous phase ion so there are two types of ionizations. Uh, the first one is hard ionization and the second is soft ionization. So what is hard ionization? So hard ionization produces high degree of fragmentation yielding highly detailed mass spectra 
but involves rupturing of multiple bonds. So, uh, in this particular uh, type of ionization, you hit your sample with a high energy beam of electrons, which is known as electron uh, ionization, is one of the examples in which the energy transferred is huge to the sample and this disrupts the sample a lot. And you get various sub fragments of your sample. So, say you had a protein. You get protein, uh, smaller peptides as well as you get broken up parts of amino acids as well. But th what this allows you to have is a highly detailed mass spectra. So from one uh, round of ionization, you will be able to tell even what the amino acids were in the peptide sequence. But as it involves rupturing of multiple bonds, at the end detecting from the mass spec graph what exactly your uh, original sample was is very difficult. So here in the above graph, you have an example of hard uh, ionization. As you can see, there are multiple peaks throughout the graph, which shows that uh, uh, like the hard fragmentation or hard ionization occurred, and the sample has fragmented into very small subunits. But on the other hand, soft ionization involves formation of molecular ions with mild protonation or deprotonation. Make it, making it possible to be coupled with room temperature conditions such as uh, liquid chromatography and mass spec. So soft ionization is the like uh, in soft ionization this uh, includes chemically induced ionization techniques as well uh, which does not involve very huge energy transfer. It, uh, it is a very mild technique in which uh, mildly protonated or deprotonated varieties or species of the sample is produced. And in this case, uh, you are able to detect uh, it very easily and very distinctly through the mass spec curve. So here we have a example of soft ionization. So here you can see there are only two uh, peaks present, which are two large peaks. And uh, using this particular information, you can easily determine what the starting species was. So uh, hard uh, fragment, uh, hard ionization gives a lot of uh, detailed information, but is difficult to interpret. Soft ionization gives very distinct information, but it is not very detailed in nature. So uh, many a times it has to be coupled with other techniques. So uh, we have discussed uh, soft ionization, like not under this name, but as we have seen that we have many a times discussed LCMS with another MS being done. So liquid chromatography followed by mass spectrometry followed by another mass spectrometry, which is known as tandem mass spec approach in which you again ionize the sample after the first round in order to get more detailed view of the entire sample uh, concentration or the sample analyte. So this was ionization. Uh, next we will look into what is MALDI. So MALDI or matrix associated laser desorption or ionization is a technique uh, is an ionization technique that uses laser energy absorbing matrix to create ions uh, from large molecules with minimal fragmentation. So MALDI was a like breakthrough technique in which a, uh, like our sample was mixed in a matrix. So the matrix is essentially another solution. So the first uh, time it was used uh, with alanine and the aromatic uh, uh, with the aromatic uh, amino acid and then blasted with lasers. So alanine does not want to go into its uh, gaseous phase in ionic form easily. But mixed with the aromatic amino acid was easily able to uh, go into the gaseous phase and uh, this was the start of MALDI. So essentially you mix your sample with the aromatic matrix and then you hit it with laser and that easily allows it the particular sample to go into a gaseous phase. The sample is mixed with the aromatic matrix material and applied to metal plate. The a pulse laser irradiates the sample, uh, triggering ablation and desorption of the sample and matrix material. The analyte molecule are ionized, being protonated or deprotonated in hot plume of ablated gases, and followed. This is followed by downstream processing. So essentially, you mix your sample. So the blue is your analyte, uh, your matrix. The green is your sample. You mix both of them. You hit it with a laser beam. The entire thing then uh, goes into a gaseous state with analyte and uh, analyte as well as your matrix combining into a gaseous ionic form. You then send it into a mass spec uh, grid or mass spec tube, and then you will get 
uh, uh, you will be able to analyze your particular analyte only and then determine what the sample exactly was. So it, this is MALDI. So MALDI is just the ionization technique in which you mix your sample with the aromatic matrix and then hit it with laser in order to form easily form uh, in order to easily form your gaseous or uh, ionic states. So taking all of this together we are looking at the question again. So the first is converts the analyte into a gas phase or ions in vacuum. This is called soft ionization. This is true. Converts analyte into liquid phase ions in vacuum. This is called hard ionization. This is false. Hard ionization is also forming gas phase ions just with a higher energy which causes a lot of fragmentation. So number two is false. In MALDI, the analyte is mixed with the aromatic matrix and bombarded with laser. This is soft ionization. This is true. And in MALDI, the analyte is mixed with the aliphatic matrix and bombarded with the matrix is bombarded with fast beams of argon and xenon atoms. This is called as hard ionization. This is false. So the correct answers are one and three, which is option B. Okay, so. So the correct option is option B. So does anyone want uh, he wants to ask anything from this? Uh, what is solid phase ionization? What is solid phase ionization? Solid phase ionization in case of mass spec. Okay. So I uh, have not come across the term solid phase phase ionization. So let us uh, let me just check. Okay, so a quick, uh, quick Google search tells me that uh, solid phase ionization is something very new and is the uh, new variant of electron ionization. So electron ionization is one of the hard uh, hard ionization techniques that, that we were discussing and it is used to uh, extract out a very large ion. So I, call, I came across a paper in which they have been using uh, that technique in order to extract uh, so uh, they have been using in order to extract large molecules such as on on dan citron which is a huge molecule and they have been able to extract them uh, such large molecules into gaseous phase using this technique so i have not come across this technique before so we, we you know i will get back to you on it yeah uh, because in one of the assignment, uh, the question was, uh, the question was uh, uh, it is related to the solid phase gaseous phase ionization technique. Are you it was related to the ionization or not chromatography you are talking about? 
no no it, it is, is just related, related with, with the mass mass spectroscopy technically so uh, in it we have to match that different ionization methods with the actual techniques that is if uh, it is a gas phase ionization then we have to match with the moldy or it is a photo ionization or is it a chemical ionization so uh, there was a question that uh, there was gas phase ionization solid phase ionization so sorry solution phase ionization and solid phase ionization and we have to match it with the different techniques that is electro spray and chemical ionization and photo ionization so what is the correlation between these two? so if if uh, i'm right uh, am i right that gas phase ionization is related to moldy yeah or solution phase is uh, chemical ionization is it a is it a chemical ionization and what is solid phase so solid phase is it what it is electro spray or something else it won't be electrospray i will guess it is a photo ionization something related to that but since i have also not come across this so i can't say so i would uh, suggest you know put a, if you want to you can put this into the forum and you know ask the course ts about this particular question since the, they have given this into the uh, assignment questions and maybe they can come back to you okay sure sure thank you so much uh so that was this particular question uh does anyone have anything uh to ask regarding this one okay so moving on we go to the next question which is in 2001 the first draft of the human genome was released Uh, the objective was to read the entire human genome from start to finish scientists from all across the globe confronted a number of challenges in sequencing the whole genome which of the phenomenon does not describe the issues that have arisen in the human genome project so the so which of the following is not uh, uh is not an issue which is arisen from the human genome project which is not a problem so the options are sequencing the multiple re uh, replication start sites sequencing the multi gene sequence especially in the shotgun approach sequencing the non coding gene sites uh, both option a and b and both option a and c so only one option is correct you can go ahead and uh, answer what you think is the correct option so shubhada says it is option d which is both option a and b are correct anyone else wants to try and answer this so which of this is not a problem that has arisen from the human genome project Uh, so let us go through uh, a bit of shotgun sequencing before answering this particular question. So this is a schematic of how shotgun sequencing works. So shotgun sequencing is a sequencing technique uh, that is based on sharing large stretches of uh, DNA into smaller fragments before sequencing. So the shotgun sequencing was one of the major tools that was used during the human genome project. the sequence reads are then aligned to form the original sequence 
this uh, method is uh, very efficient and was used during whole genome sequencing during AGP. But one of the downsides of the technique is the presence of overlapping repetitive sequence or multi-gene families that have multiple copies across the genome make difficult uh, reconstruction difficult of the entire thing. So first let me go through the schematic and I think uh, we will better understand what exactly we are talking about. So during hierarchical uh, shotgun sequencing what happens is that we first have our genomic DNA which is a huge sample size but during the when the human genome project was being done so the best techniques we had for sequencing included the Sanger sequencing method which only could sequence up to a thousand base pairs so obviously we cannot go ahead and sequence the entire 3 billion base pairs that the human have uh, using this particular technique so uh, instead what happened is that we sheared up the entire sequence uh, using restriction digestion enzymes and we got very small small copies of the entire thing and then we uh, mapped these copies and cloned them into what are known as bacterial uh, uh, back libraries or bacterial chromosome libraries and then sequenced these smaller clones. So uh, the back clones were then sequenced to form something like this and one clone will overlap with, uh, with another. So because a number of clones were formed, so the same sequence of the same gene had multiple reads. So these are known as reads. The actual sequence things are known as reads. So the first what you did is that you sheared up your uh, entire DNA. You got smaller clones, you uh, sequence the clone and uh, call them as reads. The reads are then aligned to form the entire structure of the clone. So one example is given here is one uh, from one clone or uh, one read reads such as this and another read overlaps it and then starts towards the other end. So since both of these are uh, overlapping, we can say this is essentially the same sequence that is continuing. And when you assemble it, you will form one gene sequence which uh, goes across a larger length. So if you do it for her every thousand base pairs, so say last 20 of each of the uh, reads are overlapping, then you can keep on adding it till you have the uh, largest stretch of DNA sequenced. The only problem with this entire approach is that if we have repetitive sequences that are present, so say if uh, this particular part uh, that is uh, common between both reads, it was common in multiple reads. So that will be a huge problem because the assembly via uh, just matching one part of uh, the shotgun sequence will not be possible. And this is the major uh, problem that was faced during the whole genome sequencing that repetitive uh, sci sequences such as that of the centromere, the telomere as well as multi-gene families that have multiple copies of genes throughout the genome were difficult to place because they had multiple reads that were overlapping with other uh, gene sequences and other locations as well. So that was the major problem that was uh, faced during whole genome sequencing or the, uh, during the uh, human genome project. So that was shotgun sequencing so anyone wants to uh, ask anything from this <laughs> okay so uh, going to a particular uh, question so which of these does not describe a problem which has uh, arisen from the human genome project the problem will be Number B, sequencing multi-gene sequence, uh, especially using the shotgun approach. So the options that are correct or, uh, or do not uh, pose any problems include the sequencing of multiple replication start sites and sequencing the non-coding gene sites. So the correct option is A and C. So this is the correct one. So because these two pro were not essentially problematic for the entire a genome sequence is that fine
does anyone wants to add anything to this So that was this question. So now we enter something uh, interesting. So this is essentially something I would uh, encourage everyone to actually get your computer or phone out and uh, try alongside because this is a bioinformatics based uh, question which we can easily do side by side. So now uh, the uh, question is uh, you have uh, included bioinformatics course in your curriculum. In your first class, you got to know about NCBA. As an assignment, you have been given an accession number of a protein coding gene ID 3611. So please enter the following details that you could uh, retrieve from exploring the database NCBA. So the question is, what is the name of this protein coding gene uh, 3611? Specify the organism as well. You have been given four options. The gene is integrin linked kinase, organism is Homo sapiens. Gene is APOA1, organism is Homo sapiens. Gene is integrin linked kinase, organism is Mus musculus. And uh, gene is fatty acid synthase 1, and organism is Homo sapiens. So, only one option uh, among these is correct. You can uh, go ahead and uh, open NCBI on your phone, laptop, whatever you have alongside you and uh, put in the ID and tell me what exactly is the correct option. So Shubhada says it is A, integral linked kinase and the organism is Homo sapiens. Okay, so uh, I would encourage everyone else to try and answer this as well. So go ahead, open up uh, NCPI so it also opens easily in your phone browser as well. Open it up, put in the ID and tell me what exactly the protein coding gene and the organism is. Okay, so seemingly, so I guess my screen is visible, right? So you 
So, friends, uh, uh, seemingly many of us have a problem to find in CBI, so we will go uh, through the entire exercise right here. So, just typing in CBI will give you this particular uh, Google page which opens to the National Center for Biotechnological, uh, Biotechnology Information. So, this is a uh, portal. So, NCBI is a portal for uh, databases all along. So, there are three types of databases that are available for bioinformatics. The first is uh, known as a primary database, the second is known as a secondary database, and the third is known as a portal. So, NCBI is a portal that opens to various other databases. So, it has uh, information about many other uh, uh, databases that can be seen from right here. Uh, it has uh, Cleanware, which is a clinical variety of database, uh, databases and information regarding that. Genes, which has information about various genes. Genomes, similarly about different genomes. There are other very interesting ones such as the Omium dataset which gives us uh, mutations along uh, particular which are responsible for various diseases and various other data sets which are very interesting and in the useful for uh, various biotechnological work, uh, uh, workflows. So uh, you have to do nothing but enter whatever you want right here in the search box. This can be name of any protein or gene that you want. For our particular exercise, this uh, is just the ID of the particular protein that we are given, 3611. We entered it and uh, looking uh, at right here, this is a page that will open next so it uh, depending on a larger classification of databases we will have options that we can click we have literature genes proteins genomes clinical and pubchem so from here since uh, we are we have been given that is the protein encoding gene we will go to the gene database under this and that will open a page such as this and from the page itself we can see that the gene id 3611 corresponds to the integrin linked kinase homo sapiens so the first answer is right uh, very evident right here so what is the name of the protein coding gene and specify the organism as well the protein coding gene is integrin uh, linked kinase and organism is homo sapiens right here from the first page itself from the first uh, the first line of the page itself so uh, that was that so that uh, the option a is correct shubhada was correct so next we have the uh, next question which is in which chromosome number does the gene reside pick out the correct ensemble id for the above mentioned gene as well the options are given right here the chromosome number is 7q21.7 the chromosome number is 11 p 15.4 chromosome number is 17 p 13.1 and 19 q 11.3 so it, the information is present on this particular web page only i would encourage everyone to try and go through the uh, web page and try and uh, you know, find where the information is hidden essentially So, so if you have not yet uh, done it, so I would uh, ask everyone to you know go ahead and put the gene ID three six one one into the NCBI browser. Find the particular uh, page you are looking for, and now uh, after look, coming to this page, try and find what exactly is the ensemble ID. Uh, what is the question? Okay. Uh, this is the question you have to find uh, the chromosome number where the gene resides and the correct ensemble ID for the above mentioned gene. For the gene ID we have been given that we have to open NCBI, put in the G, uh, protein coding gene ID 3611 and then find the chromosome number and the correct ensemble ID for the chromosome number.
So our channel says it is B that the chromosome number is 11 P15.4 and the ensemble ID is this. So anyone else wants to try and answer this? So by going to the same page you have to just someone is saying something. I guess. So uh, you have to go to the same page and just uh, look for the chromosome number. Is anyone doing that? Okay. So just sliding on through this particular page itself, uh, we have a genomic context as well, just the next uh, what is ensemble idea. I will get so uh, just sliding on through to the next. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, next category, which is genomic context, we have the location as 11 p 15.4, 11, which means it is a chromosome 11 p, that is, it is the bigger arm of the chromosome. 15.4 is just the marker. So this is the chromosome location of our particular gene. So that is the answer to the first question. So it is 11 p 15.4. And what exactly is ensemble ID? So ensemble is another secondary database to which our uh, particular gene ID connects to. What we have to do is uh, so it contains information, more information about various other things. We just have to find the ensemble ID uh, from this particular page and link to that one. So the ensemble ID should be here. Okay, the ensemble ID is given right here. So, uh, clicking on this, do not go away from the page. Right clicking on this. So, this opens a second, uh, uh, another database which is known as ensemble, which contains the genes present in the genomic context. That is exactly the location on the chromosomes and various other information about the genes themselves. So here we have it is present on chromosome number 11, present in the forward strand, how many transcripts the gene has and various other information as well as the chromosome uh, genomic map where exactly it is present and everything else. So essentially uh, using the ensemble database we can find various more information about the genes in detail if you need. So uh, from this particular question, we have the ensemble ID given right here, which is uh, five zeros one six six triple three. Matching both of them, we have uh, the option B, which is correct. So five zeros one double six triple three. So the correct option is number B. Chromosome is eleven uh, P fifteen point four, and the ensemble ID is this. So this was uh, for this particular question. So. Going on ahead, the final uh, question is what is the length of the gene? And also write down the uniprot ID for the protein it encodes. So we have a lot of options, we have to just go through it again, find the length of the gene and the uniprot ID. Uniprot is another secondary database which contains the information about the encoded protein. So just go through the uh, entire web page and try and find what the size uh, of the protein is. and for the unique plot ideas.
so getting back to the question the question is uh, scan okay. mm, sorry for that whatever that was okay so this is the question uh, what is the length of the gene please mention it in nucleotides and also write down the uniprot ID for the protein it encodes the options are the length is 3449 6884 7126 and 5397 so we can just go ahead and go to that web page again, find the length as well as the uniprot ID and tell me what it is. Okay, so seemingly, so let me help you out here. So, for uh, the size of the gene, you go down, 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 down here, and this is your uh, genomic reference. So, it, uh, this particular section refers to different other databases from the gene database. So, we were in the, in the gene database and uh, we can go to the genomic database to the mrna or proteins database or uh, so from that uh, we can actually determine the size of the entire gene so what we will do here is uh, using the genomic database we will go to the gen bank database go right here also homo sapiens integrin link kinase this now you can see opens in the nucleotide database instead of the gene previously and from here we can see that the uh, gene is 7168 base pair loop so that was the information asked and for our other information that what is the uniprot id here in this mrna and protein section we can find the uniprot id as q14 uh, 13418. So, Uniprot, as I said, is another important uh, database which contains information about uh, encoded G, uh, proteins from the genes. So, you can see right here. So, uh, the protein level information of the gene is given right here. So, it is receptor proximal protein kinase regulating integrin mediated signal trans transduction and can act, uh, act as a mediator of the inside out integrin signaling. Various catalytic activity of the proteins is also given and various other information. So that is how you exactly use NCBI in the connected databases in order to gain a uh, summarized overview of what exactly your gene and protein does and uh, use this in order to help you along your research. So using both of these uh, information we know that uh, the length of the gene was once uh, 7126 uh, base pairs and the uniprot id is q13418 just going through the ncbi portal we can find all this information very easily so uh, anyone has any question regarding this Uniprot. Okay, so Uniprot, as I said, is a secondary database uh, which contains information about the particular gene 
at the protein level. So here we can see that uh, various information of the protein itself is given like uh, various functions are given right here. So uh, it is a focal addition protein called part of the complex and various other information like it is a conversion point of the integrin and growth factor signaling pathways. It uh, the various catalytic activity of the protein is given right here. Uh, how it is regulated, various features of it, uh, gene ontology annotations. So where uh, exactly does it lie at the gene ontology level? So like which uh, functions throughout the cell can it do so it, it can act via the cytoskeleton protein binding uh, it has a function in that it has a function in transport activity it has a function in structural molecular activity it has a function in gtps activity as well as uh, how it is associated with other G, uh, proteins like cellular components of focal addition kinase membrane nucleus and how exactly it fits into various other enzymatic and pathway uh, databases. So this all information you can get through the Uniprot database. So uh, the protein level information of your particular gene can be found out using this particular database. But as you saw that we can get to every of one of this information just by using NCBI and uh, like knowing where exactly we have to search. So I would recommend you go and see the bioinformatics course uh, a lecture video that was given in the course that in, in that particular video it was like uh, we had a detailed approach on how exactly to go to these various databases and get information out of them and that will I will think I believe will help uh, you know gather more information and uh, help you uh, get you know use bioinformatics the best way you can uh, anything else So that was the last question. So I thank you all for joining this particular session. If anyone does not have any more questions, then we can just okay. Uh, so this was the week seven like uh, PMR and PTL session. Uh, if no one has any more questions regarding this particular session, then uh, I will. Will bioinformatics come to exam? I do not believe like opening directly. I do not think the like uh, direct opening of uh, browser tabs and looking at it will come. But you will get some info, uh, info uh, like important questions such as like where exactly, uh, what exactly NCBI is, how exactly you should use it. Like if you just have go through the entire thing once more on your own i think you should be able to answer this uh any questions related to this okay so uh, if no one has any more questions that i thank everyone for joining and uh, see you all next week for the week eight lectures thank you